Thanks for the, introdu thanks for the introduction. Um, where's my slide? Oh. OK, so for this talk, I'm going to present a new definitional framework called Indistinguishability Up to Correctness, INDC for short. So just in one sentence, um, it is a new technique um, for you to write security definitions or to design security games in such a way that you don't need to attend to travel wins, uh, or more specific, spe specifically excluding travel wins from the adversary. Um, hence the title, Simplifying Game-Based Definitions. So let's first start with a review about indistinguishability, IND for short. Uh, as we are, not, we are all familiar with, indistinguishability is about an adversary advantage notion um, that measures how good he is in distinguishing a real game G from an ideal game H. In this setting, an adversary A would ask questions to one of the two games and receive responses from the games. His job is to differentiate uh, which games he is interacting with. So the indistinguishability advantage um, of an adversary A against games G and G and H are defined to be this probability difference that he outputs one um, in both worlds. So this concludes somehow, uh, okay, so based on such an adversary advantage, um, a game G is, is called indistinguishable from an ideal game H. If for all adversary with reasonable amount of resource, uh, his distinguishing advantage is small. This is all very familiar, um, but I want to emphasize is that um, indistinguishability won't be so useful and um, so important in our field if this slide is all what it's about. If you go through the literature, most of the definitional work uses indistinguishability in the following way. Um, the games G and H are really constructed in such a way that it depends on some crypto schemes pi. And then um, people would define all kinds of security advantage against such a scheme pi as the IND advantage of the games G and H that are instantiated with this pi. Throughout this talk, I'm going to call this way of defining security as the conventional way. So let's first go through some examples of what conventional games look like in the literature. So here is a game that defines key indistinguishability or bidirectional ratcheted key exchange. The relevant talk was given right here by Poitering uh, two days ago. Here is another one that's about, um, that models integrity property of uh, a primitive called data stream channels. It is a joint work done by Fisherlin et al. in Crypto15. Yet another one. Uh, that model circuit hiding property of onion encryption. By the way, onion encryption is the encryption algorithms used in onion routing network like Tor and Mixnets. This is a recent work done by uh, Dagger Braley and Stan, uh, I believe in EuroCrypt 18. All these games are really complex, so maybe let's switch, some, switch our mind and start with some games that look not that complex. Here is a game called Auth sub i. Um, it models the authenticity property um, of stateful authenticated encryption, the same topic as, uh, as mine. Mm. So if you look at their secret, uh, uh, it is a joint work done by Boyd Hill, Boysnin, uh in CTRSA 2016. If you look at their code, it doesn't look that bad. Uh, at least it's comprehensible. Um, however, just within one year after their first publication to CTRSA, the same authors publish a revision in which they uh, revised the pseudocode of their security games to ePrint, in which they added this special processing to one of their subcases, um, and even this revision is still not correct because there really should be a return R statement between line five and line six. I believe it's just a typo. So all these stories and, um, and complex games uh, motivated us to think about um, what are the essential problems 
about indistinguishability paradigm. So as you can see from the previous slides, the definitions or the security games related to those are really complex and subtle in such a way to a degree that they are just hard to debug and believe. Worse, um, a prior work of Larry Hoffens and Kills showed that even with the most basic security definitions like INDCCA security for public key encryption schemes, people still would mess up and they are vague. In terms that they are vague of how trivial queries from adversaries are disallowed. Uh, the authors showed that just by tweaking the way that trivial queries are disallowed, you can define uh, multiple inequivalent security notions for INDCC security, for public key encryption schemes and key wrapping algorithms as well. In summary, it's just hard to justify um, for a cryptographer once he writes down some pseudocode of security games for some security properties. It's just, it's hard to justify for him, uh, does this game really capture what I want? Part of the reason for that is there's no good theory um, for cryptographers to use as how to create security definitions. In the literature, we have many good tools and theories to um, upper bound adversary advantage given existing security definitions, security notions like coefficient H methods, expectation arguments, for example. But as for how to create that security definitions, um, typically we're on our own. So our IDC framework is supposed to fill in this gap. In high level, it works like a definitional compiler where you feed into this compiler um, two security games that capture what you want, but really do not work because there will be trivial winning strategy for the adversary. So the definition on the left-hand side is bogus. However, you live with that, you pass these uh, security games to the compiler and it will automatically generate two edited games for you whose IND advantage um, results in relevant, uh, reasonable security notion in which there is no triple win. So what is this definitional compiler then? Um, it's a process we call Oracle editing. It works like this. We start with two utopian games, G and H. The games are called utopian because there are trivial wins to win this. There are trivial winning strategy for the adversary to win these games. We again provide, uh, we in addition provide a correctness class C. Um, that is mathematically just a set of crypto schemes uh, of which satisfy certain correctness conditions. The correctness condition is just a familiar functional property that a class of schemes need to satisfy in order to work. For example, for public key encryption, this would just be the decryption needs to be the reverse process of encryption. You pass these three building blocks uh, to the process of Oracle editing, and this will output the edited games G tilde and H tilde. We then define a new adversary advantage called INDC advantage in the middle at the bottom against G, H, and C, simply to be the plain indistinguishability advantage against G tilde and H tilde. The same advantage would then use to be um, whatever security advantage against the underlying scheme pi. Okay, so what is this Oracle editing process in particular? Um, in order to illustrate this, I would first go deep into our game playing model as shown here. Security games in our model consist of initialization procedure, Oracle procedure, and finalization procedures. These are written in pseudocode and they are stateful, they have states, so that uh, the game states are maintained across invocation. An adversary A would simply ask questions to the Oracle procedure, receiving responses, and then he would, uh, uh, and then it would at his, um, at his will output his own output Z, which usually equals to the game outcome omega. This will be what the utopian games um, behave like. Like I said, there needs to be edit done. So what is this editing? Well, we added the utopian games by adding this uh, yellow demultiplexer. 
this demultiplexer will, um, before each time the response is given to the adversary, computes a silencing function psi um, on the current game transcript. The game transcript includes all previous adversary queries and responses. And if this silencing function returns true, the response of the oracle yi would be replaced by a special diamond symbol. We call this oracle silencing. Okay, so now comes the real crux of our whole framework. How should we define this silencing function? Because this really um, captures what we mean by trivial queries. So we think that a query is trivial if the adversary, based only on the current game transcript, and based solely on the fact that the underlying scheme is in the correctness class C, knows the answer beforehand. So let me repeat this, this is very important. We think a query is trivial, so it should be silenced. When an adversary based solely on the current transcript, that includes all his queries and responses at this point, and based solely on the fact that the scheme is in the credits class, knows the, under before, knows the answer beforehand. Formalizing this idea, uh, we define the silencing function in this way, that given t, the answer is fixed across all schemes pi in the class C, for the real, if the adversary interacted with the real game. We formalize, um, uh, we give definitional formulas for these silenced functions. I don't want to go deep into this, but only want to point that um, the silencing function here uh, is a logical or of a fixedness predicate. That means whenever there were prior queries um, that it needs to be silenced, it remains so. So it's like a silence then shutdown approach. This concludes the description of INDC, but um, before I leave this topic, I need to mention one important caveat. That is the silence function needs to be efficiently computable, or at least on the domain that matters, transcripts that can arise in G sub pi or H sub pi. If this does not hold, the intuition that um, because the adversary knows the response so he should not ask it, uh, simply would not hold. Let's summarize how we use INDC to create definitions. We first formalize syntax of, uh, of schemes pi, then the correctness condition, this will give us a correctness class, the same step as the conventional way. We next design utopian games G and H. And in doing so, uh, we don't need to attend to logic for excluding trivial winning queries, for example. Along with C, this determines the INDC security notion we want. Finally, we need to verify the silence function, silence of CG is efficiently computable on the relevant sets of transcripts. Okay, so that is the conclusion of INDC framework. Let me go through two examples for that. The first example is, let's use it to define INDC security for public key encryption schemes, a very familiar notion. I'm going to uh, perform this definitional process first in the conventional way and then by our INDC way. As we're all familiar with, a public key encryption scheme consists of uh, two probabilistic key algorithms, key generation and encryption, then a deterministic decryption algorithm. The correctness property is um, just that for all messages, if you encrypt by a public key generated by the key generation algorithm, and you decrypt that, you would get back the original message. All these are very simple. So let's try to design security games for INDCC security. This is the first attempt, uh, both the real size G1 and the ideal size H1 share initialized key decryption finalized procedures that have natural semantics, except for the encryption oracle where in the real side you encrypt the real message, but in the ideal side uh, you encrypt an all zero bit messages. If we are working in the setting of conventional way, uh, I'm sorry, if we are going to give conventional indistinguishability-based definitions, we know that this is not enough. There are ways to trivially win this game. Adversary simply uh, asks encryption M, gets back C, then he decrypts C. So that by practice, in the real world, he would see the original message M, but in the ideal side, he would see the all zero-bit messages M. Traditionally, there are 
um, multiple ways to exclude such trivial wins. Uh, you can either exclude from consideration, um, uh, exclude from consideration all adversaries that make such trivial queries, or you can first allow such trivial queries, but finalize, in the finalized procedure, you um, penalize that behavior by returning zero. Ballari, Hoffens, and Qs called the first one exclusion style, the second one penalty style. Okay, this is the conventional way. What about our INDC way? We need to have first syntax, correctness condition, which we already did. We need to have utopian games G1 and H1. This looks the same as the first attempt. And the difference with the previous slide is there is no logic for excluding. There's no code that uh, attends to the exclusion of the trivial queries. All the security code here looks very natural, and that's it. C1, G1, H1 define an INDC security notion, and we've shown, that we've shown that the resulting INDC security definition is equivalent to the conventional one. Okay, you might say this doesn't look very uh, promising. You only managed to remove two lines of code. So let's go to our main example of state of authenticated encryption. There have been many prior work on this. Uh, I've listed three of them, as you might imagine. Uh, they tend to have different syntax, different security goals, and they have um, relatively complex security games. That's most important. So let's try to use INDC on stateful authenticated encryption. First, the syntax. Uh, we simply augment the traditional authenticated encryption syntax by a state space, both in the input and in the output. And the next, we need to define correctness. Somehow, uh, Surprisingly, this question, uh, to the best of our knowledge, was not answered explicitly in the literature. We choose, a, um, if you think about the question, what is a correct state of authenticated encryption? So if you apply that over a reliable channel, things really matter here. Uh, if you apply that over a reliable channel, then you might only receive the re, uh, require the receiver to decrypt correctly, only uh, just for the ciphertext that's received in order. But if you're using stateful authenticated encryption over unreliable channel, then you might need a stronger correctness requirement. You might require the receiver to decrypt correctly for any out of order ciphertext, uh, except for replay, for example. Between these two, there can be many variants about this level of fidelity for the receivers. We choose to model that uh, by a level set, L. This is just a set of natural number sequences, so that a number sequence is in this level set if and only if it is considered a permissible orderings of the ciphertext generated by the sender. At the bottom is our formalization for this correctness class that's parameterized by this level set L. The next, the next step is to give real and ideal utopian games. As you can see, compared to prior work, our security games are much more simple, thanks to the INDC, because we never, uh, we no longer need to write out the explicit logic to exclude those trivial winning queries from the adversary. We have an safe AE construction that satisfies uh, the resulting INDC CCA security notion as well. So finally, let me conclude with some of the possible variants for INDC framework. All the, so everything I just talked about actually is about one central question. How do we f formalize the silencing function to reflect the idea of excluding trivial wins? There are many definitional choices apart from our silencing function, uh, which is a silence then shutdown style, we can instead um, silence once but allow additional queries. There can be ideal side editing. We don't silence the real world, but instead we edit the ideal world responses uh, by the real world ones. There can be penalty style editing, where you simply modify the uh, finalization procedure to penalize um, whenever in the transcript there is a fixedness query. There can even be symmetric silencing. Uh, let me skip this, but I want to mention that out of these four, three of them, 
we show that they are expressively, uh, they're equivalently expressive as our initial version. However, convenience does come with some price. Um, first, definitions coming out of INDC are abstract. In terms that the edited games do not have concrete security code. However, most of the time it can be concretely recharacterized so that you can do the conventional uh, security analysis against it. It is still a speculative proposal. We've only used it on onion encryption, public key encryption, and state of authenticated encryption. Um, but we expect the idea can be broadly applicable, and there definitely needs to be more work um, done on this topic to understand how general this uh, idea works. And uh, that's all for the talk. Any questions? <laughs>